Energy and mass are really two forms of the same thing. That's why we can write it out as E equals M, energy equals mass. Get it? Well, Einstein spelled out their exact relationship with a celebrated equation E equals mc squared, where the letter c stands for the speed of light. Mathematically, the c squared is a constant that tells us how exactly energy and matter are related. I find it helpful to look at the units, mass in kilograms, a speed of light in meters per second, that means for the right side of the equation, you get kilograms meter squared per second squared. What's the common unit for energy? That's the joule. Remember that energy is the capacity to do work, and work we measure as force times distance. For distance, let's give that the meter. Now for force, recall from Newton's second law, A equals F divided by M. Solve for F, and you get F equals MA. The MA is kilograms meters per second squared. So add it all together, and for a joule, what you really have is kilograms meters squared per second squared. Sound familiar? So energy and mass are really quite relatable. Why am I going into all this detail? Well, I want you to appreciate why it is that energy and mass have a lot of similar properties. What? Energy and mass? What do they have in common? Well, just about everything. They're two forms of the same thing, like one mouth that can either smile or frown, or one coin with two sides. That's what this remarkable equation is telling us. Why does a rock fall downward when you drop it? Because mass is pulled down by gravity, hmm? Light is a form of pure energy. Is light similarly affected by gravity? The equation says yes, absolutely. What happens to a light beam bouncing between two upright and perfectly parallel mirrors? Amazingly, it falls. How fast? As fast as a rock in free fall, which would be 9.82 meters per second squared here on Earth. Gravity pulls down on light just as it pulls down on mass. The only reason we don't normally notice this is because light travels so fast, which is some 300,000 kilometers per second. That's not per hour. That's per second. In one second, it travels 300,000 kilometers, which is around the world seven and a half times. Throw a rock straight up, and it'll soon fall straight back down. But the faster you throw it, the higher it will go. At a certain speed, it will have enough momentum such that it will never fall back to the ground. Rather, it will escape. This is called the escape velocity. On Earth, the escape velocity is about 11 kilometers per second. That's right. Throw a rock upward at 11 kilometers per second, and neglecting air resistance, it'll never fall back to the ground. Of course, 11 kilometers per second is about 24,000 miles per hour, which is way faster than even the bullet from a gun. What about shining the light from a laser beam straight up? It has to travel faster than 11 kilometers per second to escape. Oh, it travels 300,000 kilometers per second. Okay, so escaping is no problem. As I said, the effect of Earth's gravity on light is minuscule because light travels so fast. The sun's gravity is much stronger which explains why starlight grazing past our sun gets shifted. Astronomers measured this way back in 1919. It was the first hardcore evidence showing that Einstein was correct in asserting the equivalence between energy and matter. Likewise, light from distant galaxies doesn't always travel to us in straight lines. Rather, it can get bent and distorted as it passes by galaxies in the foreground. Sometimes it gets bent by what appears as nothing, which is strong evidence that there's actually something, but we just can't see that something. 
We'll talk more about that in a future lesson when we get into dark matter. For now, I want to remind you of what you get after a red giant dies and collapses. That's right, a white dwarf. Remember, a tablespoon of white dwarf material weighs a couple tons. Just think how fast you'd need to throw a rock upward from the surface of a white dwarf in order for it to reach escape velocity. Well, escape velocity from a white dwarf would be about 6,000 kilometers per second. So forget about throwing the rock upward. Would light from a laser beam escape? Sure. 6,000 kilometers per second is still way less than 300,000 kilometers per second. How about when a supergiant collapses in a supernova to become a neutron star? Now, please recognize that a white dwarf is about the size of Earth. A neutron star, which comes from a star much more massive than our sun, is only about 10 kilometers in diameter. Yikes! And get this, its escape velocity is about 200,000 kilometers per second. No way could you throw a rock upward. What about a laser beam? Yep, still no problem. The speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. But we're starting to get there now, aren't we? The escape velocity is getting closer to the speed of light. So you know where this is going, eh? If the star that collapses has a mass greater than about 40 times the mass of our sun, the resulting dense object may well have so much gravity that its escape velocity exceeds that of the speed of light. Shine the laser beam upward, and guess what it does? Yes, the light beam falls right back down, which is to say the light can no longer escape. What you have then we call a black hole. Black holes can form from the collapse of exceedingly large stars. They can also form when two neutron stars crash into each other. And guess what we likely have at the center of our galaxy, where stars are so abundant that the idea of night and day makes no sense? Yes, it's a black hole, but one with a mass of about four million times that of our sun. We call that a supermassive black hole, an SMBH. Perhaps it wouldn't surprise you to learn that there are likely supermassive black holes at the center of every major galaxy. So now you know how and where a black hole can form. Let's talk a little bit about some of their amazing properties in the next lesson. Good science to you.